So, Sergey, the floor is yours. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks, you guys, for joining. Um, uh, during the talk, if anybody has questions, um, are, are we saving them till the end or are we allowing people to interrupt? I don't remember. It's up the... to you. It's like, uh, yeah. I mean, if, if, well, I, I, if you want, I can try to keep an, hand, an, an eye on the people raise hands. If, if you want to okay so so I, I mean i think i should finish in 20 minutes but uh but if people ask during the questions then i guess we'll just assume it's going to go for like 25 right yeah, is that the idea okay um okay so uh yeah i guess most of you guys might already know me uh my name is sergey chinico i i worked on protein structure prediction and still do um and today i'll tell you guys about uh inverting pretty structural prediction models for solving various problems in, in, in structural biology. Um, you guys may have already heard a lot of interesting work in the last few years about inverting models for protein design, uh, but turns out besides just for protein design, there's lots of other cool things you could do with inverted models. Um, and so I, both me and, and Patrick will describe some of that work. Um, uh, I might be a little biased and mostly telling you guys about the stuff that we've done, but there's other people that have also been inverting models for various applications. So so whatever I say is not the only thing that's been done in the field. Uh, this is just things that I've been involved in. Um, uh, and one of these models that we were really, really excited about is AlphaFold. Um, and this is just a quick schematic of what, what I believe AlphaFold kind of looks like. You have a sequence, you have a multiple sequence alignment. You can get some profile information about this model, like what position is conserved. Um, you could also take that PSSM profile to search for templates and you feed these into the model and you can make a prediction and you could cycle this to improve the prediction. Um, so, so this is the overall schematic of AlphaFold. Um, but one thing that we saw pretty early on and others have seen as well is that as, as soon as you remove the MSA information and just give AlphaFold a single sequence, um, it, it doesn't do so well. So this is showing distribution of, of TM scores where if you use a multiple sequence alignment, you get really, really good predictions. But as soon as you remove the MSA, uh, AlphaFold doesn't perform really, really poorly. Um, but interestingly, um, if you do actually provide the single sequence and the template information, um, it actually does pretty well. So this is showing the accuracy if you actually just give it the right solution. Um, so if you give it the right solution, it's able to give you the right solution. But that's probably not too surprising. You could imagine the model just like pass all the information through. Uh, but the part that we thought was actually really, really exciting was that if you give it intermediate solutions, then it's actually able to rank the solutions correctly. So these are decoys generated by Rosetta. And so if you start passing decoys to Rosetta, what we find, uh, I mean, generated by Rosetta into AlphaFold as templates, it's able to tell you, okay, this is the right structure, this is the wrong structure. And this, these are the predicted uh, accuracies. In this case, when I say accuracy, I mean uh, TM score. Um, and so when it doesn't know that this right answer, the, the predicted accuracy is low, uh, when it is the right solution, it's predicted really high. Um, and and so, so this was quite exciting because it, it looked like it was actually doing even better than Rosetta itself in terms of ranking these decoys. And then also models like Deep Accuracy Net from David Baker's group, it seemed to also outperform that method as well. So the method, so the interesting thing here, Alphold is not trained on for this task specifically, uh, but it seemed to have learned some kind of energy function inside it. Uh, the other interesting observation related to this is that any input structure you feed AlphaFold, it, it improves on top of it. So if you have a structure that's far away, it's able to improve on it. If it's close by, it sort of stays behind. So these are the accuracy of the input structure and the accuracy of the output structures. Um, so this sort of led us to this hypothesis that uh, AlphaFold itself has essentially didn't necessarily solve the protein folding problem, but it sort of maybe uh, solved the ability to do something called local search. So the idea here is that maybe a multiple sequence alignment or a template brings you close enough to the correct solution. And then via recycling and the structural and the structural module, you're sort of able to get closer and closer to the right answer. And so you sort of are able to find close enough solution and then you get closer. But of course, if you're far away here, you may be able to get to here, but not much further. Um, and, and so the question is now, what, what can we use this information for? Uh, because it looks like there's some kind of uh, model uh, uh, sort of, embedded some kind of energy function embedded alpha fold. And, and the way we can think about this energy function and how to actually extract it is via a couple of input outputs from alpha fold. So you have, as I said earlier, we have single sequence to multiple sequence alignment. We have template information. This is all the information that essentially being scored by the model. Uh, but the outputs from the model, besides just the structure that we're all familiar with is we have all these different confidence metrics like uh, PLDDT, which you could think of it almost like a site-wise potential 
and, and then PLD and PAE, which you can almost think of it as a pairwise potential of some kind. Uh, but also for every pair of positions, you have a distance distribution. But also on top of that, you actually have an MSA output, which I think most people don't realize, but AlphaFold actually predicts a multiple sequence alignment. Um, and the reason I'm telling you all this is because now we could imagine we have ways of scoring our inputs. The inputs could be a sequence, a multiple sequence alignment or template, and we have lots of ways of scoring it. it if it's a structure, we could ask it to score how well it matches a given structure, um, or we could just optimize for the confidence, and the confidence can be parameterized as uh, as PLDT, PAE, uh, also, uh, uh, how do you say, the distogram, uh, the distances that you can, sh the sharpness of these distributions. Um, but also you could actually optimize to say, hey, how good is the MSA output itself? Because if, if the logits don't match really well to the input logits, then there's probably the disagreement here. Um, and this is essentially how AlphaFold missense to some extent works. It's like essentially checking to see how the output features maybe mismatch, but not exactly, but sort of uh, really approximately matching something like that. Um, okay, so so we know we have inputs and we have all these different outputs. Uh, what what can we do with them? Um, but before we go into those details, I just wanted to quickly, for those of you that don't think about much about how training or these known networks are trained, uh, this is just a quick toy uh, slide here showing what do I mean by inverting models and what do I mean by uh, modifying the inputs to uh, change some kind of output. So traditionally, when we train a model or we learn about training model like a neural network, we have some black box here. We have, let's, for example, an image of a cat um, and the model returns some kind of output probabilities. Uh, we have the ground truth, which is we know that this is a picture of a cat. And so what we do during optimization or training a model is we optimize the inputs of the model itself. So in this case, the parameters of the model itself to try to uh, minimize this loss here. Um, and interestingly, once you've trained the model, you can now say, hey, let's invert the model. And what I mean by invert the model is now, now we can give the model a completely blank input. Um, and now this model will probably give us uh, equal probabilities. Like I have no idea this is a cat, dog, or fish, uh, but let's say we really want it to be a cat. Uh, and so we could also compute gradients on how to update the inputs uh, in order to get our desired label. Um, and so this is the, the whole idea behind inverting model um, and optimizing the inputs is that we can take a model, this could be alpha fold, it could be any model. Uh, and then instead of optimizing the input parameters, we could literally just optimize whatever input the model goes. So it's like we're training essentially the, the inputs um, and so this could be like, we could optimize the templates, we could optimize the MSA, uh, and then our loss could be any of these things based, based on any of these functions that are output from the alpha fold. Um, just to make sure I have time. Okay, so just to give you one example, or actually I'll, I'll walk you through two examples of what we where we tried this, is say, well, what if we in optimize the template somehow? Um, and so one simple idea is say, well, what if we just start with some random vector this vector doesn't even have to be a real protein sequence. It's just some input vector. Um, in this case, particularly, sorry, to step back a little bit, this sequence here, um, in this case, we're not going to use the MSA. We're just going to pass one single sequence through this whole model. Um, and then we're going to pass this uh, uh, sequence to an instance of AlphaFold, which I'm going to call a generator, because essentially, if you just randomly change the sequence um, or this random vector, it will return to you some structure, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but then we could take that structure and pass it to another instance of AlphaFold, but in this case, actually give it the sequence we care about. This is our this sequence of protein, uh, and we get a prediction here. And so this prediction is now based on some kind of confidence metric. Um, and then the idea is that we can propagate the signal all the way back through the model and update our input vector to generate other, other alternative structures that might have a better uh, uh, solution. Uh, and so essentially, we could take two instances of AlphaFold and treat one as a generator and one as a discriminator, um, and then just literally just keep cycling this cycle over and over and over, and essentially try to find a better template input that gives us a back, a, 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 in this case, a lower loss function and a more accurate model. Um, and so, so this is just one example. Um, we, we actually tried this across many, 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 many examples in the PDB. Um, and one thing that's really promising is that uh, when it fails, the confidence are pretty bad. Like in this case, everything here is red. Um, but when it succeeds, we actually often get the correct solution. So whenever, so the x-axis in this case is the accuracy, TM score higher is better. And the y-axis is our loss function where we're trying to minimize 
In this case, we're trying to maximize the confidence. Um, and so th there are, of course, examples where there's like these alternative, in this case, it's like literally a helix. So this is probably not a good example, just one helix that flips back and forth. Um, but in there, and so, so this sort of seems like a really interesting direction to say, well, it seems like we already have a, essentially a energy function. What if we just keep optimizing, like keep optimizing the inputs uh, until we actually get the right solution. Um, and whenever it fails, it's usually not a very bad failure. Like it's usually just because the search problem is not so great. Um, and so, so this generator is essentially just a hacked version of AlphaFold, but there's actually been other work in the field. Uh, you guys may have seen uh, AlphaFlow from uh, MIT, uh, where they essentially try to train like a diffusion-like model to generate deep voice uh, to pass to uh, AlphaFold-like instance. Uh, so, so there's definitely some really exciting work in this space. Um, now, another question you might wonder is that, well, okay, we can, we can uh, uh, change the template, uh, but another thing you might, what, what could we actually dock templates? And this might be interesting for people to do protein, protein docking. Um, and so one of my uh, work from my former postdoc, uh, Siri and, and uh, Shihao, um, is where they also ask the question as well, you know what, what if we give AlphaFold the two templates, like fix them, we're not going to change those two templates. Nice thing about AlphaFold is everything is relative. So you could just give the two templates without defining how they're connected to each other. Um, and then you could just take the sequence, in this case, just the sequence representation, um, and just treat it as a random vector. And this could be it could be positive, it could be negative, like we don't care. Um, and then what we could do is we could try to maximize uh, or, or some kind of uh, loss function, sorry, minimize some kind of loss function. So uh, in this particular example, we were uh, interested in, this, in the problem where somebody gave you some experimental data, like somebody says, hey, these two proteins need to be docked in this particular configuration. Uh, and when you give the two alpha fold, the two uh, proteins, it doesn't think they should be docked matching that constraint. And so you can essentially keep optimizing this input sequence until it, those constraints are matched. Um, I mean, you could also just uh, optimize for the, uh, how do you say, the confidence itself. And I think that's what Patrick is going to talk about. Uh, but in this particular example, we're optimizing just the input sequence to bring the two structures together to match some uh, known restraint. And so this could be two restraints, or it could be one thing matches something else. There's a lot of ways you could define this as you got full freedom to define the function any way you want. Um, okay, so that's, uh, but then once you've made this this model, then you could potentially rank these models using the very, very similar approach that I just described to you by ranking a bunch of decoys uh, and selecting them from all these essentially, uh, how do you say, decoy generation protocols. Um, and for the very last topic, um, I will also talk about the other problems. They will, okay, besides updating templates, could we also just update MSAs? Uh, and I think last cast, we saw some really exciting examples of this where people just generate a whole bunch of MSAs with like a bunch of different E values, uh, uh, different ways of aligning these, different using different methods, uh, different databases, and so on. Um, but what, what, what if we just ask this more simpler questions like, well, maybe this MSA itself is just poorly aligned. Um, so, so just the big picture here is we've got a single sequence, we have an MSA, we pass that to AlphaFold, AlphaFold returns a structure, but maybe the confidence is not so high. What if we propagate this confidence all the way back and realign the sequences? Um, to explain what I mean by that is often we like to show these really nice pictures of everything aligned, but in reality, things start off as uh, sequences that are not aligned to each other. And then we use methods like H splits, blast, jackhammer, omega, and so on to, to bring the sequences aligned. Uh, but one interesting thing is all these methods actually make the assumption that all the positions are independent of each other. Uh, and, and we know that that's not true. Um, and so there might be better ways to align these sequences that maybe uh, uses like AlphaFold as the confidence metric. Um, and, and so one, one project we worked on is this idea to say, well, what if we make this error differentiable? Um, and if we could make this error differentiable, then we could pass the signal all the way through to the, the alignment of the actual sequences. Um, so how do we actually do that? Well, it turns out any alignment could be expressed as a matrix. So for example, if I wanna align this human sequence, this cat sequence, I can construct this little matrix, uh, which describes how these two sequences are aligned to each other. And, and every time you have a matrix, you could also use neural networks to express those matrices. Um, and so the general idea is like we could take our initial sequences, pass them through a convolutional neural network, get embeddings. Uh, we could take the outer dot product of those embeddings to get a similar matrix. 
and then we could pass them through Smith Waterman to get the alignment. Um, and one thing, I, I don't have much time to talk about this, but we spent a long time uh, trying to get a really fast differentiable Smith Waterman algorithm to backprop through. Uh, and so we have that working now. Um, and so this allowed us to sort of connect all these modules together. So just to summarize what I mean by that is like, we have all of our sequences, we have a query sequence, we could pass a convolution through it. We have all the other sequences in MSA, we could also pass the same convolution, get similarity matrices, pass them through a, a smooth Smith modern algorithm to get the alignment. Uh, using this alignment tensor, we could now describe how these sequences align to each other, pass them to AlphaFold, uh, and then start maximizing the confidence. Um, and so now we can align these sequences to each other and try to optimize. And so this is this idea here is that maybe the mo initial multiple sequence alignment is not correctly aligned. And if we optimize it, maybe we could actually get a better alignment and, and it's for the better structure. Uh, here is an animation of one uh, CASP target. Uh, this is actually now two CASPs ago. Um, but in this case, there's not that many sequences. There's only like 13 sequences or so. And here you could see essentially we're playing like a game of Tetris to some extent of moving these blocks around. Um, and here you can see as we're optimizing this MSA, the uh, the confidence of the model gets higher, higher, and hotter, higher. Uh, but also you can see the structure becoming closer and closer to the ground truth. Um, and so this is just one example uh, of one domain in CASP. Uh, we've actually applied this to a couple of other examples. In this case, we purposely focus on examples where there's not, not that many sequences, where even a single sequence could potentially make a big difference if it's correctly aligned. Um, and we found that we could often find an alignment, and this is just showing every dot here is, a, is essentially uh, one of the points along the trajectory. Um, and we could see we could often find, uh, so this is showing the original points coming from just mm seeks alignments. Uh, and we found that we could take the original mm seeks alignments and just move the columns around until we actually sample a structure that's most closer to the right answer. Um, and, and it doesn't always work like this. In this particular example, we weren't able to find a solution that was any better. Uh, but it does seem to show, it seems to suggest that maybe one thing to think about in the future is how do we, that it's not just about sampling or finding better sequences, but even the same sequences could potentially be better aligned to each other. Um, one one other thing which I don't have a slide for, but Sam also looked at a few other examples, and and so Sam is one of the uh, uh, first authors on this paper. And what, one thing we found is that sometimes the alignments we get back are not always necessarily better alignments. Um, and so it turns out sometimes you can maybe trick AlphaFold to sort of maybe sample alternative sequence space. So sometimes when you get better solutions, it doesn't always mean that the alignment is better. It's possible just, just shuffling the sequence around a little bit was enough to sort of uh, maybe trick AlphaFold into sampling other structure space. Um, and so I think this is something that maybe uh, uh, Patrick will talk about as they say, hey, instead of fixing the alignment, could we maybe uh, maybe just modify the, some of the input vectors and maybe move around the sequence space? Uh, so, so it's possible some of these don't necessarily work for the right reason. Um, okay, so I think there I'll stop. Uh, and I just want to put a little plug in here that we do have a library, which we call Collab Design, which incorporates AlphaFold, TR Rosetta, and PNN. Uh, now are also, also RF Diffusion, which allows you to backprop through all these methods together and optimize the inputs in different ways. Uh, these methods were originally developed for, for protein design, but it turns out you could use them a lot for lots of cool other things. So, okay, I think I'll stop there and check for any potential questions. Yeah, yes, go ahead and talk to say something. Oh. Something in the uh, something in the queue. Uh, Randy had a question. Do you want to say, say it yourself? Or... Sure. <laughs> No, it's a simple question. Uh, when you're optimizing the MSA, as you mentioned there, um, does your new alignment agree better with a structure-based sequence alignment? It's a great question. So we would assume it should, um, but it turns out sometimes, so, so I guess we'll step back a little bit. It turns out that if you take a sequence and misalign it, uh, AlphaFold will ignore that sequence. Um, and so in some scenarios, we think what's actually happening is that there's some sequences that don't belong in the MSA. And so they're sort of steering the prediction in the wrong direction. Uh, and so here, what we're doing is we're just saying, hey, make this prediction as, as confident as possible. We don't care how you got there. And so it seems like in some scenarios, the sequence was misaligned in order to be ignored. Uh, because when you when we usually when we align sequences, we're trying to match as many columns as possible. But in this case, the objective was like, try to uh, get as high as confidence. 
Um, so, so I guess it's, I would say yes and no. For some examples, it looks like it's actually making a better alignment. In some cases, it looks like it may be the fact that just the sequences were misaligned is actually what made a better result. Okay. Sergey? Uh-huh. No, no, sorry. Uh, yeah. Hi, Sergey. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's it's me. It's uh, uh, thanks a lot for the great talk. A slightly unrelated question about alpha fold training. So mm -hmm. you mentioned the histogram loss. Do you have any idea why it's that classification and not regression loss here? Why would you classify the distances? Uh, that's a great question. So, so I guess one question is like, why, why even bother predicting histogram instead of just actual real value values? Is that what you're asking? Maybe. Uh, um, kind of. And well, the, the question uh, which I don't have uh, the answer myself is, you binarize your predictions, which can be a simpler task, but then the laws doesn't care if your prediction is off by one bin or by ten bins. Basically, mm -hmm. it's uh, the same mistake according to the loss function. Why is it better than the regression task? That's a good question. So um, there's something that you get back for free from binning things. Um, and so so for, I guess one thing I didn't mention was the PLDT is also binned into values. The PAE is also binned into values. Um, and, and then also the distances are binned into values. Um, it, it does seem kind of silly, but turns out there's two things you get for free. Um, one thing is if, let's say if your model is not confident, you get back some kind of distribution. So one advantage of binning the values is instead of returning a single value, so let's say that there's like two peaks here. And if you did essentially regression or you said predict a single value, um, it will give you the mean of the two values. And you have no idea how accurate or how confident the model is. But then if you have a, essentially a bin distribution, you get like these two peaks or multiple peaks. And so you actually get some kind of confidence metric. Um, so, so I think that's part of the reason to bin things. Uh, that being said, you could try to bin things in a smarter way or rewrite the loss function to say neighboring values, I'm not gonna penalize as much. Um, we had actually tried that back in the day with TR Rosetta and we found that there was no improvement by doing that. So like we tried to use instead of cross entropy, we said, hey, what if we actually, uh, say the values next next to each other should, we're not gonna penalize you as much as getting those guys. And it turned out it didn't really make a big difference. Um, and, and I guess the third point related to this, um, there seems to be an interesting part when it comes to neural network training is that a lot of times neural networks like to divide and break things up. Um, and so the idea is like, let's say if you want to, as you're doing gradient descent, you're going from let's say a value of zero to a, a value of a hundred, you essentially have to take a whole bunch of gradient steps to get there. Uh, but if you break things up into small bins, essentially, then it's really easy to move between, like, let's say, from zero to 100. It's because it, internally, you just have to upweight some numbers and downweight other numbers within your outputs. Um, so so I guess you could say, uh, in practice, it turns out, even if you're trying to predict a single value, it, it looks like it's just much easier to train by breaking these things down. Um, and, and I think that's the reason why. It's just because it's really easy to move around uh, uh, between large and small numbers, if you sort of essentially just make them all zero and one instead of um, actual values. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, very convincing. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you something? Also? How did you uh, write this differentiable Smith Waterman? So it's not a dynamic algorithm anymore? Like, what do you do there? So it's still dynamic. Uh, so these are slides that I've skipped, but now that you asked me about. Is uh, it the, yeah, question. so what did you write it in? So the question is like, how do you actually make it differentiable? Um, and the and one really simple idea uh, that Bonnie uh, Berger's group has shown before, we say, well, what if we just say, well, softmax times softmax in both directions, right? So that's like the simplest way to explain, like, how do you make something that's not discrete to discrete? Um, and so then you could change the temperature around. But what we found is when we actually did that, that um, you got these alignments that didn't actually look correct. Like you essentially had mm -hmm. things that didn't actually always form uh, straight paths, um, or I guess you could say monotonic paths. Um, and so we essentially needed some kind of dynamic programming algorithm. So the question is, how do you actually make it dynamic programming? Um, and uh, I don't really have a lot of time to go into the details here, but essentially, here, I'll, I'll just skip forward. 
Uh, but essentially what you could do is you could just implement dynamic programming directly inside Python and then backprop through the whole process. Um, and so here, for example, is a similarity matrix um, and you could actually go through step by step and, and, and calculate the actual uh, scoring matrix. Um, so what I mean by that is like, imagine you have your, your, this initial starting matrix um, and you could go through all the rows and all the columns and just keep track of the maximum score. So let's just say this is your starting scoring matrix and you go through every single one and every single row and every single column and you construct this HIJ matrix. Um, and once you have this HIJ matrix, then you could take the largest path and, tr and trace through it. Um, but then the question is like, how do you actually implement this inside a GPU to make it fast enough? Um, and it turns out one really tr simple trick um, is to actually try to rotate the whole matrix. And so, sorry, let me just... Um, so here, here, so there we go. Uh, there's this idea called uh, striped dynamic programming, where instead of going through all the rows and columns, what you could do is you could essentially run through the diagonal of the matrix. Um, and so then it, it becomes a much uh, simpler operation. And so this was described back in the 90s. Um, and so we've actually did this exactly in Jack. So let's say we could rotate the whole matrix. Um, at one point, I actually asked one of the developers of Jack how to do this. Um, and so we could take this matrix and rotate the whole thing. And then now we now can run everything really, really efficiently uh, through the whole thing. Um, but now the question you might wonder is like, how do you actually do the trace back? Like, how do we go in the reverse direction? Uh, and this is something we, we actually discovered by accident. Um, turns out if you take this matrix and you take the max value, um, and then you just backprop and say, hey, how did the input matrix have to look like to get the max value? You actually end up getting back uh, the the trace back. Uh, so so the gradients of the max HIJ matrix will give you back the trace back. Um, well, so the nice I, 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 this I didn't under, I didn't follow this. No. Oh, like so. So this is uh, partially discovered by chance, but the, essentially what's happening here is once you've run through and kept track of the maximum path through the whole thing, um, mm -hmm. and you, if you grab the max value and you you ask the question how do the values in the input need to change to maximize this max value? And it turns out the gradient is literally uh, the traceback uh, of the yeah, whole. Okay, I see. I see. I see. Um, and, and this is something, uh, if you're curious how this actually works, uh, turns out there actually was a paper back in 2016 where they essentially showed the same thing, where they mm -hmm. said you could take any uh, forward backward algorithm um, and the backward algorithm is literally just the back prop of that method. Yeah, I mean, it makes um, sense now when you say it, but I would never have thought about this, I think. Yeah, but and it was something, uh, what happened was we discovered by chance, it's like we implemented this first step and we're like, okay, does this even, like, can we even back prop through this, right? And yeah. so I set up a little function, it's like, let's back prop through it. And then I was like, what? It gave me back the, mm -hmm. the path. Uh, and so then I actually contact Houston, say, like, hey, what's going on? Like, how do we get the back, uh, the back prop? And he's like, oh, actually, uh, uh, this is something that's already known uh, in the NLP literature. Uh, like you can you can get a path through a, uh, in, uh, any of these forward backward algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, and but one one thing I should mention here related to this is that if you do take the max, um, you you get the uh, either zeros or ones, which give you the trace. But then the problem is you can't take a second derivative on top of that. Like let's say if you want to backprop through the Smith water algorithm, um, and so it turns out. Um, what you can do is you can replace the max with the log sum exponential. Um, and if you replace the log sum, so essentially, sorry, go back to here, you can replace this max operation with the log sum exponential. Uh, and it turns out if you uh, do that instead, so if you take the log sum exponential and you take the derivative of that, then you actually get the soft max, which essentially just tells you which direction you're moving in. Um, yeah. So we replace. Mm -hmm. So to make, so I guess you could say to make Smith-Waterman double differentiable, which is what we need in order to backprop through the whole operation, is we need to replace the max with the log sum exponential. Um, and so now, now we have essentially the, the how do you say, the derivative is a soft max, and then you could take the derivative of the derivative to, to pass through the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. but so soft the, max is always used for this, right? Instead of the max uh, in all of this replacement so on. Oh, so so what I mean is, uh, sorry, to go back to this operation here. So as we're going through this whole operation, normally in the, in the normal, uh, uh, how do you say, Smith Waterman, you always just take the max. Like, say, no, I know, I know. But I mean, if you want to make something that has max 
uh, differentiable, you always take the softmax. It's like standard, no? Oh, so in this case, instead of taking the softmax, what we're doing is we're going to take the log sum exponential. Okay. Um, and then the derivative of the log sum exponential is the softmax, which essentially is the decision uh, of, of which direction you came from. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So so cool. essentially, we t we uh, we replace, how do you say, it? we replace this max operation with log sum exponential. Um, and then from that, what we get back is uh, the actual soft max when we take the derivative of that when we pass through the model. Um, so so now so now we have the ability to uh, now we get a soft path. Um, and so these guys all, all this way and this way never go higher than one. If that makes sense. Yeah, very cool. Right, yeah. Okay, I think we should uh, go on. So now, Patrick, you might okay. have the right talk. Yeah. Well, it was Patrick's fault. He asked the question. So. Yeah, it's my, it's my fault. It's okay. I, I wanted to know. Of course, no problem. <laughs> go ahead. Can you see my presentation? Perfect. Yep. Yeah. So I am Patrick, maybe most of you know me as well. I used to work uh, for Arne, uh, was his PhD student. And now I'm back in Stockholm and I've just started my own lab here uh, at SciLife Lab and also at Stockholm University. And uh, uh, this talk is a lot about using AlphaFold Mutimer. So I think you all know what this is, right? It's a protein complex prediction. And uh, a lot of people are interested in that because it's uh, important, the complexes for the cell and so on. And uh, the idea from this comes from uh, uh, Bjorn Wallner um, and his CASP 15 results. Uh, you can say that uh, we also ran uh, the baseline alpha fold multimer here, uh, which was also done by someone in this group. And uh, what Bjorn found was that if you introduce sampling, uh, noise in the predictions in form of dropout, you can get a lot better results. Uh, the problem here is that it requires a lot of sampling. So uh, Bjarni ran 6,000 predictions per cost target, and the most samples really end up down here. So they are not that uh, confident and the doc Q score is also low and for only yeah one two or three here out of six thousand did you get the high ranking confidence and the high score uh, so this is a very inefficient process and uh, uh, deep mine has also added this in right they now do 100 predictions per target and more recycles uh, with early sopping and so on. So uh, it tells you something about that maybe sampling is necessary, uh, but uh, my idea was that maybe it doesn't have to be so inefficient. So I thought that maybe it's possible to learn a more efficient sampling uh, and kind of construct the trajectory from kind of down here where most samples are to up here. And the idea was that kind of the network would uh, get an input structure and learn how to kind of up sample this into a high score. Uh, and this would then be some kind of diffusion uh, for protein complex prediction or prediction of different conformations. So you could see this as a kind of denoising procedure to get the better structure. Uh, and yeah, this would basically work with inputting one confirmation here uh, and then having another network that then learned how to denoise this to end up up here. Uh, we never did this, uh, but instead what we did was develop something that we call AlphaFold profile. And this works then only on the MSA based on uh, a lot of previous work you know, on Sergey and so on. And uh, uh, when AlphaFold Multimer makes a prediction, it takes a sample of everything that is in the MSA, right? And this is because you can't fit the whole MSA in ROM, so you need to sample it somehow, and you need to create some kind of statistical 
statistical profile from the samples. Uh, and this then goes into the MSA features. Um, and the most important part of the MSA features is the cluster profile, which really contains yeah, the statistics of the different sequence clusters in the MSA. Uh, and the idea here is that some samples are better than others. And this was shown by Bjorn, right? Um, that he managed to, in some cases, sample some things that gave a high score. Uh, and since the MSA profile is the most important coevolution representation, and this is based on coevolution, uh, if you would sample something that is kind of wrong, as you could see with surrogates, like uh, you misalign some sequences to get them uh, away, right? And uh, then you would also end up with a noisy profile, and then you probably end up with bad predictions. Uh, so what we thought was that uh, we will not be able to really know how to remove these beforehand, but maybe we can kind of block them out by adding some kind of bias or filter that would act as this denoising process that we kind of thought about uh, would be a diffusion, which was kind of the original idea. Uh, so uh, what is this then and how do we do this? Well, we base this on uh, the idea that the score or ranking confidence, which is a combination of the predicted TM score and that of the interface, is related to the structural quality. And this is really from Sergey as well, right? That he has shown that AlphaFold can kind of rank things. Uh, and Bjorn found this also, that the score is highly related to the quality of the output. So what we do is that we take the sample sequences, which go into the cluster profile, and then we initialize a kind of a weight matrix with this bias. And we predict the structure, and we take the score and calculate gradients based on this bias to update it. Uh, and this is really the whole process. And then we just run this many times and hopefully we get the better structure. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, this is based on a lot of previous work, like uh, learning alignments and designing proteins. And a lot of other people have also done similar things uh, during the years. Uh, we also add in recycling here because it helps the structures uh, and the accuracy. But we also thought that if we have recycling, we have to learn a very robust uh, bias, something that is kind of helps somehow uh, across different recycles and different samples has to kind of extract the most important information of the cluster profile. And it turns out that this works uh, in some cases. So, here you see uh, the average optimization curve. Here's the confidence and here's uh, hours uh, for a targeting cost. And uh, as we improve the confidence with uh, this protocol, we also get a better score. Uh, and here is an example of um, how this uh, looks like. So you can see that when the confidence suddenly improves here, and uh, we will also start to get uh, a higher MM score. So yeah, and then kind of decides on that this structure was the best one, and this had the high score, kind of stops there. Uh, so we, to see how well this works kind of overall, we use the benchmark from Arne, and uh, we he, uh, split everything that AlphaFold Multimer version two, uh, was not trained on uh, and we took everything from there that had low confidence so you could kind of single these things out from a single alpha fold multimer run and then we ran it to see if we could improve the scores and uh, what you see here is the alpha fold profile mm score and versus the alpha fold multimer mm score and this line here is a cutoff of 0 0.75 mm score 
which was used in this benchmark uh, also uh, as a, a kind of accuracy cutoff. And in a lot of cases, um, we get kind of an improvement. So the success rate goes up to 29% here compared to 13% without the full multimer. And in general, we get 15 additional, 50 additional complexes that are actually predicted. Uh, compared to just using alpha fold multimer, uh, and 13 or not. And these methods are exactly as expensive to run, uh, which was kind of the idea to not have to spend 6,000 samples uh, to kind of get this. Uh, and here is the relationship between the ranking confidence uh, and the MM score. And I mean, this is not that great. Uh, but it seems to work to some extent. So you see the, the running average here, and this is the density of everything. So you have a lot here that is kind of not improved, and we don't really know uh, why or what's going on there. Uh, but some things are really made a lot better at high confidence. What we find is that if the structure changes a lot during the run, it's probably accurate. So we have, we looked at kind of the structural change and the final MM score, and we find that when things, everything that kind of changes a lot somehow is accurate. So it turns out that some things may perhaps be in their own confirmation uh, and maybe we can kind of rescue this. Uh, but I don't want to say too much about that because it's, it's a tricky business to kind of know what's accurate there, I think. Uh, you also have some examples here. And so the native structures are in gray, predicted in blue. And here we start out with an MM score of 0 0.44, which increases to 0 0.96 and the confidence as well. And the same here, so 0 0.52 to 0 0.93, and just by running this alpha fold profile. So it seems that it can help to kind of find this more favorable confirmations uh, in some cases. Uh, but I would also say that these differences are probably informative. We just don't really understand uh, why yet. So to summarize, um, the information here is in the MSA and AlphaFold and AlphaFold Multimer knows when the predictions are accurate based on this confidence. Uh, like Sergey showed also that it can be used to kind of rank things. And uh, I think that this strategy of uh, one and two uh, is a good one to kind of improve predictions, but maybe also to search for different alignments or different confirmations uh, in the future. So thanks a lot. And thanks to Frank in Berlin also, who I uh, did this work with. Okay, thank you. Time for questions. Sergey says I need to leave. Uh, uh, thanks both of you. Um, no, not Sergey uh, O, but Sergey G. Uh, so, um, I, I can. So, so, so can, can you tell me? I didn't really get the, the, this bias. Is this just a weight? How, how is that? Yeah, the... it's just a weight matrix. So it basically it starts with zeros, and then the, the network modifies. So, so it's it... like training a neural network, but during inference, you can say. So we basically train this weight matrix for each prediction run. And you, and you train with back propagation. Yeah. We just back, I mean, it's already set up, right? So we yeah. just use the same, uh, we just add the training loop and then, uh, yeah, just back prop to update only this matrix. Yeah, it seems quite simple. And you said it was as fast as the other one, as multimer, because you, I mean, it should take some. We use a hundred samples, so I mean, okay, if, if you run hundred yeah. okay. so you run one sample instead of a hundred, so you run hundred times. Yeah, I mean, we run hundred iterations, yeah. right? So we basically do back, but I mean, it becomes a little faster since when it's kind of compiled and everything. Uh, but I would say it's more or less the same, right? So we just do hundred iterations of hundred gradient descent steps. You can say. Instead of running hundred different samples, yeah. Uh, I just, but yeah, you say some compile time, but that's yeah. okay. That's nice. Okay. So any other more questions?
Uh, I guess I'll ask one. Uh, so you showed uh, the distribution of, of the samples. Like, how how do you introduce the stochasticity in there? Is it is it different initializations or just different models or how do you? Yeah. The, oh, sorry. I should. That was uh, so. That was an RNS benchmark. That was uh, four hundred different complexes. Uh, that alpha fold. Oh, it's averaging across many. Yeah, many it's things that are not homologous to alpha fold multimer training. So this was to see if we could kind of rescue this. Maybe I didn't say this well enough. So that's kind of the final evaluation that what we see is we can rescue 50 out of 400 that AlphaFold Multimer have not. Uh, but another advantage is that, you know, you not only need to know that the uh, like you don't need only need an accurate score, you also need a high confidence, right? Because if you have an accurate score and low confidence, you think the prediction is wrong. So this kind of makes it possible to select things also, since it kind of improves the confidence, right? So all of these things are kind of low confidence in up of all multimer, even though a lot were correct. I see. So do you think there could be some improvements made if you were to like do a different initialization? Because I'm I'm wondering if some of these grain descents just got stuck in some local minima, if there's yeah. some way to. I think maybe if you run this a lot of times, you would probably end up with slightly different. We just didn't do this yet, and uh, yeah, I mean we didn't really have uh, resources and time uh, at the moment. Okay, but uh, I don't I don't really know. I think some of these seem to be very hard to capture, like. Uh, some of the things that Gern also failed with, I think we failed with as well, even though he ran like 6,000 samples, right? And maybe if you run like 600,000 samples, you end up with 10 that are good. It's just very rare to kind of get that sample, right? Uh -huh. And then uh -huh. also since AlphaFold Multimer kind of resamples things now during the run, it's very hard to kind of track what information goes in there, right? It's like a compilation of everything and the previous representations and everything that kind of is combined. And that's why I'm not sure it's only the MSA samples. I think maybe it's something that has to kind of be, you know, that confuses the network somehow to go in only one direction. And I think maybe this is kind of a way to fix that somehow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Like that's uh... Uh, I mean, it may, for me, it's very interesting. You actually can play around something with the all of the train network and get so much out of it in different ways. It's like it's really big. Research. Yeah, I think maybe we all have been doing that a lot now <laughs> during the past years. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess the, new, the, huh? the, the final trick will probably actually do the train something that is better than, than all our efforts are lost. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it definitely feels like we're essentially like AlphaFolds learned like local sample and then also learned. Um, scoring like it's learned like an energy function of some kind and some local sampling but it hasn't really learned global sampling and i guess that's what we're all trying to push it to do some kind of global sampling yeah really yeah it. i mean like you mentioned the from uh, your colleagues uh you have this alpha flow and the microsoft chinese team also had something lost here right where they basically try to train they basically take alpha fold and just retrain it on md data uh, what I see is the problem there is like the evaluation. I think it's very hard to kind of evaluate these small fluctuations, but also AlphaFold has seen a lot of this. And I'm not sure that these splits are kind of made well enough to really know. It, I mean, it's the same problem with MD, right? To really know that you're capturing this. But I, I would think that we see this more in the future. Maybe you like, instead of predicting one thing, you get like a whole en ensemble of different things. Yeah. So there is Susan has a question that she doesn't know how to formulate. Uh, so I, um, do you want to try to formulate it, Susan, or should I try to do it? I, uh, I, I can um, try. Um, I, I, um, I don't quite know how to phrase this question, but I was really intrigued when you had two populations that were occurring. And I was wondering, um, did the interface, was the interface properly um, predicted, but the proteins, uh, the protein structures, the individual structures were changing? 
No. So in all these cases, no. okay. the interface is different, but the kind of individual parts are more or less the same. So basically what's happening is like this or this. I mean, that's, that's what you mean. Multimere hardly ever fails to predict the correct structure of the individual chains. It's just supposed to be in the wrong place. So that's like, it's much okay. harder to put together than it actually to propose a single chain. Thank you. Okay, so uh, as I said, in about a month, we have a talk by uh, uh, Janani Dur Durarai about proton lag and compass predictions. That's, I guess, it's also timely for CASP because then we're going to have people working on predicting ligands. And there, of course, a lot of work there, but there's one talk here. So that's, that's, uh, hope to see you. I guess it's uh, April 10th or something like that, but they're going to be emails. So thanks again, both of you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye.